Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me over here. Um, it's my pleasure to wake you up this morning. I hope you're, you're ready. Otherwise, I'll put a lot of psychedelic animations up there to wake you up. Um, I'm going to talk about, yeah, as you said, the grammar of animation. I'm going to try to convince you that this should even be a thing. Um, I'm going to talk about how one might look. And in the end, I hope that I can kind of convince you that doing animation such as what we see up here is, is really not that difficult with, a, with the correct framework, and it can actually be, be wrapped in a, in a concise and general framework, just like ggplot has, has wrapped a lot of the visualization that we're doing. So um, just a bit about who I am, like Rob told a lot about who, who I am. Um, I'm at the tax office, uh, or the tax authorities in Denmark, doing uh, machine learning. Um, and being the machine learning engineer, which simply just means that I'm taking care of a lot of our infrastructure um, and making tools for our data scientists, which is good because I like making tools and I'm kind of a compulsory um, tool maker. I make way too many packages for R. Um, as, as Rob said, I, I dabble in visualization, network analysis, um, web technologies, and the et cetera is, is getting bigger and bigger. Um, I'm, I'm blogging, I'm tweeting, I'm, I'm coding. If after this you want to try out uh, GG Animate and you find a bug, you can scream at me at Twitter or you can raise an issue at, at GitHub. The last one is absolutely preferred. Um, so, why animation? Every presentation must have some kind of why. If there's no answer to the why, then, then it's simply really, really easy for you to say, well, why should I care? Um, I feel with animation, the response from you would probably be a little bit different, something like this. Shouldn't you be talking about interactive graphics? Like this is, this is the, the thing that everyone is talking about. This is the thing that, that is the, the next step in visualization. Um, and the short answer is no, I shouldn't. The slightly longer is that nah, there's actually other people that are focusing on that. And there's not a lot of people focusing on animation. So the very long answer to it is actually the rest of the talk. Um, but I'm trying to, to like talk a bit about why I chose this path. So the success of the grammar of graphics, like we know it from ggplot2, but it's actually prevalent in other frameworks as well. The success of the grammar of graphic has sparked this like pursuit of a grammar of, of interactive graphics. Like this is the next step that we have to go. Uh, and along this way, there's been different steps of some frameworks with some great results that has uh, provided some sort of, of interactive grammar. But it can seem sometimes that, that our pursuit of a grammar of interactive graphic has, has kind of prevented us from asking, well, where, is it, where exactly is it that we're going? Like we just, we have this holy grail and we're running towards it, but we really don't know precisely what it should be. Um, and, and this has kind of led to some, some sort of false dichotomy where we have on the one side we have static graphics and the other side we have interactive graphics and, and, and we qualify them as like we have static graphics, they are static, um, and, and you, you often think of them like they are the serious, investigative, sometimes also boring and old school. And interactive graphic is kind of like everything else and, and with everything new they have all these kind of positive connotations, they are playful and explorative and narrative. Um, and this is sort of bled over to how we think about the grammar. So the static grammar is actually very well defined and, and have a strong theoretical backbone. Um, it concerns the display of data, it concerns mapping data to visual properties in your, in your graph, it concerns translating your data with scales, maybe transforming your data with statistical function. On the other side, with interactive grapher, grammar, it's kind of like just, it's everything else. Like, everything that's not static, we, we want to lump into this new shiny tool of, of an interactive grammar. And this is also prevalent in how we, we talk about the plots that we do. Like, we can either have a static plot, and we can look at this uh, static plot and say, well, shouldn't it be interactive instead? So we have these, like, we have either static or interactive. And I simply want to propose an additional dimension. Um, which is being animated. And being animated is, is actually an inherent quality in a graphic, just like being interactive. And more than that, it's, it's completely orthogonal to being interactive. You can talk about animation without ever thinking about interactivity. You can talk about interactivity without ever thinking about animation. Um, and any given display can take 
from any of these dimensions in your data, and, and, and this can inform how you want to make your plot. And all of, all of this also indicates there's some kind of continuum between the different extreme states. Like, it's not either static or animated or interactive. Um, it's a continuum of, of different states. And um, it's, it's not completely well-defined, but I hope I can convince you that we can talk about a plot being more interactive than another. Um, for instance, we can go from no interactivity to some sort of controls outside of your plot. This is interactivity, but you're not interacting directly with your plot, but you might interactively change some prospects of your plot. We can go further on and have like graphic elements as links, which are not having any control over your plot, but are taking you somewhere else, so you're interacting directly with your plot, but it's not changing anything in your graphics. And we can, uh, we can go further on with tooltips, where we actually have a change in our visual representation, like we have something that is overlaid on your plot, and, and full on into selection, where you, have, you can have selections, where you select something, you have, might have a change in color, you might have updates somewhere else in your plot with brushing and linking and so on. But bear in mind that all of these things doesn't necessarily imply that there is any animation. You can, uh, you can fi finally have tooltips without having some fancy fade in, fade out. It's simply just interactivity. In the same way, we have a continuum of animation types. Um, it's a bit less granular, but we can go from fully static to have some sort of animation between static stages. Like we have one static stage we want to, to look at, and we can go, go over to another static stage, like with faceting, for instance. We can see them as different static stages, and we can have an, a smooth animation between these two. But the different stages in themselves are still static. And we can go full on also to, to, to an animation where everything is always in flux. Like consider an animation showing Brownian motions, where all particles just constantly moving around. There is no fixed state where we, where we can just stop it and say, this is, this is something special. Um, the last is kind of even more ill-defined, but I would argue that, that you can have uh, plots that are mainly animated and less, uh, less interactive, like the, the play, pause, rewind controls of a movie is actually some sort of interactivity that is coupled to animation. Um, but it doesn't really affect the animation in any way. It lets you interact with it with, by stopping and starting it, but it doesn't really change the course of the animation, like you know from movies. On the other hand, we can have, from with interactivity, have a, we could have something like fading tooltips, which is animation, but it's not really changing a lot of, of things in your, in your plot. It's not really moving around a lot of data. It's just fading things in and out. And now in the middle of this, we can have something like called data vis nirvana, and I'm saying this quite sarcastically. Um, I think a lot of people are thinking of this like this is where we need to go. This is like the holy grail of, of data visualization, the complete coupling of, of animation and interactivity and graphic display, and this will just like solve everything for us. And of course, that's not true. The, the quality of a plot is completely judged over how well it solves the given task. And sometimes a static plot is, of course, the best tool for the job. Um, oops. Now, being a second-class citizen, the animated part has not really had a lot of, of support for tools, whereas static plots and, and anime or interactive plots has had a lot of, of different tools going up. When we're talking about grammar in, in R, ggplot2 is, I must say, the king. Um, there are a lot of other, other plotting systems in R, but they are not grammar-based. And in, uh, in the JavaScript world, we have a lot of support for interactive graphics. Uh, high chart or plotly, um, semiotic are just some examples. There are a lot of them, and, and some of them you can even uh, use from R as well. Um, and a lot of a lot of the interactive plots that we that we have incorporates animation to some extent. Like you can you can change different aspects, and you can see an animation. So you might think that that animation has kind of been folded into this, and, and we have the complete solution. But we really don't, because we have no control over how this animation uh, occurs. This is just something that ha happens automatically when, when we interact with the plot. So the, the way as a programmer to interact with this is, is completely uh, ripped away from us. We have no control. Um, another thing that has, uh, I, I think has, has led to this, uh, this idea of either static or interactive graphic is that, that static and interactive graphics has, has like more uh, traditional outlets. Um, so static graphic is, of course, prevalent in scientific literature, it's prevalent in newspaper and so on. Of course, also a lot of other places, but, but especially here. 
And while interactive graphics is newer, it also has like a, the, the stable holders of of, uh, of use. So it's been really, really popular in a lot of, especially uh, American newspapers, as, as data-driven journalism, where the uh, the reader can can use the interactive visualization to guide them through a story. And it's also been prevalent in, in more scientific, special-purpose software for uh, for explorative data analysis. But I would argue that, that animated visualization has had just as popular a venue. It's something a bit newer, but uh, animated graphic has found a very popular outlet in, in social media. And, and why is that? What is it that makes animated visualization so popular or so, so useful for that? It's something ab about moving objects. So, so there's a reason why we can't stop looking at things that are moving. It is, it is hardwired into our visual cognition system. It demands attention. Um, even more than a, a brightly red dot, which is one of the most like aggressive colors that you can have. Even so, you can compete with it by just wiggling something a slightly bit. Um, and and this, is, this is kind of important because you might, as a, as a creator of visualization, you might expect that your reader will be very attentive of what you're going to show them. You might, in vain, think that, of course, they think whatever I'm doing is, is really, really important. But you're fooling yourself. There is absolutely very, very few places where you can be absolutely sure that you have attentive readers. Social media is like, like the, the complete opposite of that. People are just scrolling through their feet, and they will not stop at your little silly plot. Because, seriously, there's an overwhelming amount of, of information, and, and they just have to get to the, to the top as quickly uh, as possible. And this is where this grab for attention can really be, be powerful. Movement also has like other utilities than just shouting, hey, at you. Um, movement in, the, in concert is actually something that, that, that is really, really powerful, seen from the Gestalt principle. Like w when you have things that move in concert, they, they seem like one unit. And, and this is something we also use with color and placement. Um, the whole theory of Gestalt principle is, is something about grouping things that are, that are sharing um, certain aspects. And movement is, is extremely strong with this. Um, and it all leads back to how our visual uh, system is, is, is wired in our brain. So there's a lot of, of, of theoretical reasons why we want moving, uh, moving pictures. It's, it's not just something that, that seems nice and, 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 and fun. Um, another reason why animation is, is really well suited for, for social media is that, um, well, the relationship between animated uh, visualization and interactive visualization is kind of like the relationship between computer games and, and movies. Um, both, both tells a story, but one of them is, is really, really dependent on a very, very active recipient. Like, you can't really enjoy a computer game without taking part in it. And if you don't want to take part in it, then you're not really going to get the story. And the same is, is true with interactive graphic. Like, if you don't have the time or the attention span to interact with the, with the graphic, you'll not get anything out of it. So, um, a passive audience like you have in social media or like you have when you're just coming home from work and just want to lie on the couch and watch some stupid thing on the television, um, it's best reached with a linear and fixed narrative because you don't have to really use a lot of, of, of activity to get into the, into the story. You'll be informed either way. Now, of course, there's no reason why these two types of narratives cannot switch over and you can have the same story that you, that you had with the movie and you can make it into a computer game or you can have the same like interactive visualization, make it into an animated uh, visualization. But the best result is uh, simply comes when you, you when you are aware of the different limitations of the different types of uh, of communications that you're using and this is why it's so important that we have strong animated uh, foundations for for doing these sort of, of uh, narratives so hopefully i've convinced you that animation is something we should think about but what about grammar why are we even talking about grammar to to understand what grammar has to offer, like, programmatically. I'm, um, I'm going to put it in a context of abstraction and something I call the ab abstraction compromise. Um, like, when you have a really high abstraction, you can do something, and you have to do something. When moving a bit lower, you can do a lot, but you have to do a lot. 
And when the abstraction becomes low enough, you can do more or less everything. But I guess you know what's coming now. You have to do everything. Um, and this is simply this is simply the compromise that that we as tool developers has to to juggle with. Like, where in this abstraction do we want to put ourselves? But we can uh, we can influence this more than just deciding where we want to put ourselves on this ladder. We uh, we can decide it by defining the quality of the API because. What I believe is that a well-designed API is actually, um, it can do this to the, to the abstraction ladder. You can actually do a lot more with a lot less. And I believe that, that grammar-based API often showcase this, because what you have is you have these composable uh, units that, that can do a lot of different things by simple uh, combinatorial um, uh, combining this, them together. Um, and all of these units are kind of well understood and simplistic. So there's a lot you can do, but it's not, it doesn't take a lot to get into. Using the abstraction ladder, we can also look a bit into what is already there, because I'm not the first one to think about gra uh, animation in, in R. Um, one of the first examples is the, the animation package by uh, Yihui, which is, uh, which is really, really low level. Uh, it simply allows you to, to create a lot of different plots and combine them into a, a movie or a GIF. And on the other hand, we have stuff like GG Animate by, by David Robinson, which, uh, which is really high level and, and, and simply uh, splits the data into separate frames within a ggplot2 call. Um, and just to, to show kind of the difference between the, the two, using the, the famous Hans Rosling Gapminder animation, um, or at least a simplistic version of it, um, with the animation package, you would, you would take the data and you would split it by the variable that defines where the different data points uh, are put, and then within the uh, save gif function you will make a loop and you will like, make the different plots, and it will take care of, of, of pr taking this output and combining it together. And with the, what David Robinson did with the ggAnimate um, package is that he, he kind of put the split and the loop inside the, the aesthetic call by adding a frame aesthetic, aesthetic to, to all the different geometries, um, and everything kind of just happened uh, automatically from there. Now, this might seem like it's, it's sort of the same abstraction level in some sense. There's not a lot of more code going on in the animation package than, than in the GG Animate package. But, but in terms of what you can do, there's a lot of difference. Uh, lot of difference. With the GG Animate th uh, approach, you can do this, more or less. Like th th this, is, this is the extent that you can do. You are fixed to the plot, what you're going to show. With the animation package, like you, can, you could make 300 random plots that have nothing to do with each other and, and put them together. It would be a horrible animation, but you could do whatever, more or less. And you would also have to take care of a lot. Like if you wanted more than just 300 random plots, but you wanted to have like smooth animation between them and so on, you would have to do a lot, a lot up front. Now, um, I personally found the, the GG Animate uh, package a nice uh, approach, but a bit too limited, and I... Um, I set out to develop something that could um, heighten the, the possibilities a bit with, with a tweener package, which allowed you to prepare data in advance for uh, showing like smooth animations between the different stages that you want to, to have. And using these two, you could kind of get a lot more done with the GGAnimate package. But um, first of all, it didn't felt like this is not one framework. This is some sort of, of outside uh, pre-processing step that, that solves some, uh, some problems in the framework that we had. Um, so I didn't feel fully, uh, fully happy with it. But this is not the only thing. Like we also have D3 is prevalent in whenever we talk about visualization, we have to at least take that in and, and, and consider it. D3 has, even though it's, it's mainly event-based, it, it also has fine support for, for creating and orchestrating animations by itself. And, and you can call D3 from R. So in that sense, we have some support. But D3 in itself is a really low-level uh, visualization framework. It's it's kind of uh, kind of compared to Grid in in the R world, where we have like well, there's really a few people that that are using Grid as as the backbone of their uh, visualization directly. ggplot2 offers a, a high level approach to using Grid, um, and in the same way, there are a lot of that, that are using D3, but there's also like a lot of frameworks to build on top of D3 to to give this more high level feel. 
Um, some of these uh, these JavaScript uh, uh, frameworks that that based on D3, something like Chartist, is, are also available in R, and some of them allows you to orchestrate uh, animations. But but again, you are kind of confined to whatever the um, the animation in the JavaScript library allows you to do. Um, then there is these more specialized um, frameworks such as Tura, which allows you to make animation, but only in a very, very specific context. Like Tura allows you to, to, to create an animation flying through a hyperdimensional um, data space and looking at your data from different angles. But that's, that's the extent of the animation that it supports. You cannot use it to, to kind of look at um, whatever uh, map data or whatever. So, so this is what it's doing. So it's extremely high level, extremely le uh, limited, but, but really, really good at what it, it's supposed to do. And as you can see, there's kind of a gap that, uh, that I think are ready to be filled out. So, so what should we fill it out? Well, if we return to our little uh, dimensional triangle, um, we can kind of think about what should the different grammars of these endpoints concern themselves with. Well, the static part, it's, it's kind of already solved. We have, we have, this is the display of data. This is the grammar of graphic that we already know a lot about. Now, with interactivity, I would argue that, that interactivity and an in, interactive grammar should simply be concerned with how a visualization reacts. So what should happen when I press on this visual element? What should happen when I drag? Not in terms of, of how the visualization responds, but just this this function, this code should run when I do this. And animation then will be concerned with how our visualization changes. So in the perfect world, we'll have a mix of these, these three where we can specify with an uh, interactive grammar that we, that we click on this and we will use the animation grammar to specify how the current plot will change into something else. And we will have this fantastic combination of, of uh, different grammars that have a very clear relationship to each other. So, changing imagery, like what we want to, to concern ourselves with with this grammar, is uh, it's nothing new, obviously. Uh, and terms already exist for a lot of these things, and these terms can be adapted, they can re be repurposed to, to allow for a more recognizable grammar. Um, animated movies is like the, the, um, the oldest form of, of, of animated graphics. Uh, and and there, are, there are things from, from animated movies that, that we can take. Things like easing, which defines the linearity of a change. The things like tweening, which defines how should one thing move to another place. Um, scenes and segways, which are also things that we, we know in movies. A scene is like uh, a confined uh, single part of a, of a story. A segue is the change from one scene to, scene to another. There's also tools like Dynavis. Dynavis is not something that has been, uh, is, is very well known, um, partly because it's not available anywhere outside of a paper. But uh, I, I put it up here because uh, it's made by Jeffrey here, uh, one of Vega's uh, co-authors and, and pedigree in, uh, in the visualization world. And is one of the first, at least to my knowledge, who, who tries to define a vocabulary for animation. Not in a grammar sense, but, but he, he defines a lot of of, uh, of different parts an animation can be concerned with uh, and put a lot of thoughts into this. Things like view, how, sh how, do, how do the view of the data changes with panning and zooming. Substrate, which is changes to the coordinate system, like the substrate that we put our plots into. Um, filtering of the data, changes in, in how the visualization looks, um, and so on. And again, we have D3 which is uh, taking things from animated movies, taking ideas from Dynavis as well. Um, so, so D3 is taking the idea of easing and tweening. It is adding ideas such as entering and exiting, like we have data that is not apparent in one frame that suddenly appear. How should it appear? And how should it disappear potentially? Um, and they also talk about transitions, which is the act of, of, of changing from one place to another. And with all of these things, I think in my mind, that we can we can put these two in, 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 in two different or we can put these in, in two different specific areas, something called the scene, something called the segue, and then we have like uh, things that are that are relevant to both of them. And a scene really comprises changes in what is shown. Like this is changes in the underlying data. This is changing in the viewpoint. The whole overarching idea of a scene is that 
the premise of the visual representation never changes. You don't have to readjust yourself. You just have to accept that data is changing along the animation. Now, this is in contrast to a segue, which is changes in the visual uh, encoding. This is uh, changes in the spatial mapping and so on. Um, for instance, a change from a bar chart to a pie graph. Oh, other way around. Bar chart to a, yeah, pie chart to a bar graph. Yeah. Anyway, um, and, and, and the thing here is that the premise of, of this type of, of change, the premise of the visualization changes dramatically. Like, like you, you have to accept that the world that defines your visualization is changing and has absolutely completely new rules. Now, splitting these two up in, in two different parts is also something that, that indicates that, that these should not be mixed. From a technical point of view, this is not a problem. Like you, you could easily change the data and change what is shown along with changing the, the way it is shown. But I would argue that this is a horrible idea. Um, if you consider a change from, a, from bar to pi, um, if the underlying data changes as well, you would have no idea of, of following this change. So even though it is possible, it, it is a, a horrible idea to do, you should allow the user to, uh, to at least have something fixed and constant when you're changing the universe of the, of the visualization. Now, making this split also makes it easy for, my, for me to say, well, I'm going to focus on the scene right now at least, because technically that's way easier than, than defining how, how to change uh, two different plot types into, uh, into each other. Um, also because I think that, that scene animations is way more important than, than Segway animations. Segway animations are really nice uh, icebreakers at parties. Like, look at, look at my animation. It goes from like a pie chart to a bar graph to a scatter plot, and it's just, it just looks fantastic. But I think the, there are, of course, some utilities for this, but I think they are rather limited. And I think in terms of a storytelling perspective, you are way more interested in telling what is happening with your data over some sort of dimension. So this leads us to back to GG Animate, which, is, which we have already talked about. Um, GG Animate is not something new. The first iteration was created by, by David Robinson. Um, as we saw, it has kind of the, uh, the idea is that frame is an aesthetic that are, that are used to define the animation. And this also means that, that fluid animation is only possible using uh, pre-processing steps such as tweener. Now, David asked me to take this over like a year ago or something like that, and I agreed uh, on, the, on the premise that I could rewrite it completely because I had, <laughs> I had all these ideas that I want to put into it, and he agreed with that, so, so that's, that's good. So, so um, the new, the second uh, iteration is complete rewrite. It's a completely new API. There's nothing in the old GG Animate that works anymore. So, sorry for that. Um, but I think it's for the better, and I think it, it gives it a, a more theoretical foundation in the same way that ggplot2 has a very strong theoretical foundation. And I think this is one of the main reasons why it has become so popular. Um, some of the design philosophies that has gone into GG Animate, the second iteration, is that uh, I want to add to the ggplot2 API. I don't want to wrap it. Like, I don't want to take, take a ggplot2 uh, object and put it inside some function that defines what should be done. I want to, to make the, the transition from using ggplot2 to, to GG Animate as fluent and, and as fuzzy as possible. Like, you shouldn't really be aware of when you're beginning to decide to make an animation. You should just add new things to it, like you're already doing with adding coordinate systems and, and GMs and so on. I also want to make it extensible by design. Like, ggplot2 has been hugely successful with its new uh, underlying implementation in, in, in allowing people to write extensions for it. Like, there's a huge, huge amount of, uh, of packages that, that adds things to it that would not be possible if it were just uh, the few developers of ggplot2 that, that had to do it. And I do hope that if at least gganimate becomes popular, that this can also be the, be the case. So gganimate used uh, the exact same uh, object system and extensible nature as ggplot, or gganimate used the same uh, object system and extensibility as, as ggplot2. So if you're already writing ggplot2 extensions, then you should feel right at home writing gganimate extensions. Um, I also want to make sure that, that the animation itself are, are expressed in unitless times. Like, you shouldn't upfront need to define that I want this animation to run for 2 seconds, 24 frames per second. 
the reason for this is that that animation takes uh, s some time to render. Like it's it's not it does doesn't take hours, but but it takes some time. And and often you might want to to make a crude version first, and then you want to to like sit down and let it render the the whole animation. Um, so I want to to express it in unitless time and defer the whole decision of whether how how many frames should be be animated um, to the the moment that you're actually rendering it. Um, so you don't have to change the code because the animation kind of stays the same. It's just a, a sort of granularity, like the dimension of the plot. And also want to make it agnostic to, to the renderer that, that we're using. So there's a lot of ways to combine image into, into a GIF or a movie. There is uh, the magic package, there is GIFSKI, which is not yet on Cran, I think, and there is the animation package uh, that we already talked about. And there's, there'll probably come others. So I don't want to tie myself and the user into how should all this be combined. They, they, can, they can decide themselves. So what kind of grammar is we adding to the, to the ggplot2? Like these are the well-known ggplot2 uh, components that we can add together, and ggAnimate adds some of these, uh, some new ones. So we're adding something called transitions, something called view, something called shadows, something called enter and exits, and something called, well, it's, it's kind of horrible to say, so maybe I'm going to change it, but easy is. It's, um, if someone has something better, I'll, I'll be happy to hear about it. And transitions are really, that, like they are often the key point of, of the animation. Transitions define how the data in your visualization changes. There's a lot of ways to take data and, and look at it from a, from a time perspective, how should it change? And, and there's a lot of ways that, that these different transitions can happen. Um, you can think of, some data you can think of as, as kind of facet wrap where you just have different states uh, and we want to animate between them, but there we can also have animations where you have like time, um, uh, a time variable. We can also have animations that ha doesn't have any fixed state, like the Brownian motion. How should we, how should we look at that? And there are different transition uh, functions that 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 can do this for you. View is uh, comprises all the panning and zooming that we might want to do during an animation. Um, what it's doing underneath it all is is changing the coordinate systems x and y limits. Um, but it's doing it in response to the data that you're showing. So you don't have to think way too much about how to define the view. It can, it can look at the data in, in the different frames and say, well, I want to zoom over here. And we can do that in different ways. So the first animation you saw where I was flying from Denmark to, to Australia uses view zoom, which, which is an algorithm for, for zooming from one place to another with zooming in and out to minimize the perceived motion of the animation. Uh, and there are, there are other ways to do this as well. Shadow is, is something new, like we haven't talked about the word shadow in before. And, and my idea with shadow is that sometimes we want to take data that, that doesn't belong in a specific frame and we want to apply it to the frame as well and plot it in the frame as well. Um, think about old school windows where you could put, put a shadow on your mouse cursor, like, like you could see trails after your, your mouse cursor, it was like really fancy. And you can do that with ggAnimate as well, uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, and there's things like enter and exit. Enter and exit defines how data should appear, how data should uh, disappear if it's not part of the different, uh, different frames that we're looking at. And again, I don't want to say it out loud, ECS uh, defines how aesthetics should be interpolated. And you don't have to interpolate the different aesthetics in the same way, like you, you can have a, a cubic interpolation of color and a linear interpolation of, of the x-axis and a, uh, an elastic interpolation of the y-axis, if you so desire. Um, okay, that's all the, the theory I have to show you. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, um, which is, I mean, it's really good when you have animated things. Um, so let's, let's get to some examples. This is clearly not animated. This is just, just to, to like, uh, situate you in the data. The, this is a really like complex plot using, I don't know if you know the empty cars data set. Um, but we're, we're looking at uh, cylinders and how it affects the miles per gallon, and we have split it by, by gear. And we're using facet wrap to do this. We can translate this quite easily into an animation using transition states. Um, we again, we are doing it with gear, and we're defining how long should the transition take compared to the state length. So these two numbers are kind of arbitrary, they're just related to each other. So, so the transition should take double as long as how, how long it rests on the different states. And we can see we get smooth animation for free, 
we get like a lot of things for free here. But it's, it's a bit difficult to understand what's going on here. Like we have no idea what we're looking at right now. So of course we're going to want to, to tell the, the viewer what are we looking at at the different stages of the animation. Um, and for that, I have implemented something called string literal interpolation in the different titles of your visualization. So what we can see here is that we have the title is fuel consumption for brackets, closest state gears. Uh, and what is really going on is that we are, we're using the glue package, which Jim was going to talk about later on today. So if this seems like magic, you can go and hear all about it. Um, but this is simply, it, it takes a, a variable called closest states and insert it directly into the string. And the different transitions provide different variables for each frame. So besides closest state, it, you could also write next state, you could write previous state, you could write in frame, which will give you the number of frame we're in, we can write progress, which would give you how long it has progressed and so on. And different transitions give you different, uh, different frame variables because state is something that is unique to, to transition state. It doesn't make any sense when you're talking about a, a time transition, for instance. Um, so the different transition gives you some information that is relevant for the different transition and you're allowed to put that anywhere you want in, in the different uh, titles. Like you can put it in subtitles, you can put it in titles, put it in axis and so on. Now there's something which is not quite satisfactory here, um, which is like this one just popped up and, and it's going to disappear again quite abruptly. Um, and this doesn't look so good. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to add some enter and exit animation, and, and some is provided for you, like enter grow, it's going to grow from, from nothing. Exit fade means that it's going to fade away. And this at least, I mean, it, it's, it's visual uh, flourish, but it's, uh, it, it does mean that you're not like abruptly taking away from your reality. Um, and, and you're actually allowed to do whatever you want with these enter and exit uh, animation. Like we have enter manual where you can just take a function which takes the data that is uh, that is appearing and modifying it somehow. So here we're just moving it to the, the left, right, depending on where you're looking at. Um, and, and it will then animate its transition from that point. So it's going to fly in. And you can do whatever you want and you can do it specifically for the different uh, geometries that you're using. So, so X mean and X max doesn't mean uh, a lot to a lot of the different uh, underlying data representations. So you can have different uh, enter and exit animation based on whether you're looking at a density plot or whether you're looking at points and so on. And the pre-existing like exit fade and, and enter grow is, is specific for the different uh, types of geometries that, that you already have. So, so it, it, um, it adapts to what you're pr trying to show. Now, as I talked about, there are other kinds of transitions. Like this is, uh, again, the gap minded data um, that, that Hans Rosling showed. We're using transitioned time this time. There's a lot of code going on, but it's really just the two last lines that are something to do with, with ggAnimate. The other is just like ggplot2 code. We're using transition time. We're using the year variable to, uh, to split it out. And then we're using a linear interpolation because we don't want to like have a, the, the different stops during the animation don't need to have uh, a specific um, importance. So a linear interpolation means that it, it would just flow through them uh, like, like you would expect. Now this, this could look a lot like transition states where you just don't have any pause between the different states. But this is simply because we have states that are equally um, uh, separate from each other. But the nice thing with transition time is that it actually operates on a time scale. So you could, for instance, if we had missing data for a decade, we don't have this abrupt uh, stop or, or change in our visualization. It simply interpolates between between them in the same time scale as we, we have for the other. So, so it's operating in a different way and it's, it's accepting that the, that the transition variable is, is, uh, is some sort of numeric or, or date time variable and, and uses that to, to lay out the animation. Now we can add something like, like a shadow to it. Now this is a bit overdone, but it's just to show it. Um, this looks a lot like, like stupid flourish. Um, and I would agree that, that for this particular animation it, it adds more noise than, than needed. But it actually has some utility, like you can show the, the length of the tail is actually showing how fast it's moving. And the direction of the tail shows the direction of your points. So, so for certain types of visualization you really want to, to be able to, to, quickly, uh, to quickly get a grasp of the velocity of, uh, and uh, an angular movement of your, of your points. 
there are other transitions, like transition events. Um, and I'm showing this with a ggref example, just to show that, that some of the power of, of building on top of ggplot2 is that it can actually work with other uh, ggplot2 extensions like ggref. So you, you get network uh, visualization support uh, out of the blue. I have not done anything to, to support it. Uh, and what we are showing here is, is a transition that takes every data point as a specific event in time and plots it and, and lets it enter and exit. Um, so, so our edges here shows, shows a human encounter at a conference. Not this conference. I haven't been following you. Um, but, but at some conference. Um, and, and this is just a time point, and I'm, I'm letting it fade in and fade out, so you can kind of see how people are moving and, and how the grouping changes over time. Um, the last uh, transition, or the last example I'm going to show you is, is, uh, is quite specific to shapes, because shapes, polygons, and, and, uh, and countries, and so on, are a bit difficult to, to transition between. Like, you can have, this is like a standard map, I'm sorry to Alaska and Hawaii and, and the districts, this is me being lazy. Um, but anyway, this is most of America um, in a standard representation. I've colored it based on, on the population count. Um, we can do stuff to that, like we can make a cartogram where we warp it based on, uh, on a numeric property, and again here, but just using population count. So, so the, different, um, the different areas get bigger if they have more population and, and, and smaller otherwise. Something that is, is really, really popular in, in this conference and, and in, in, in general in, in visualization is, is these tile maps as well, which is um, trying to remove the area component of, of, uh, of spatial visualization. Uh, and this has a lot of, of, uh, of purpose, in, in especially, um, especially if you want to map a, a color value to it, because huge areas might not mean as much as small areas. If, for instance, the population count is really low, but the area is also really small. You don't see it as, 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 as much. And these kind of tile maps is, um, is kind of working with that and saying, well, everything has an equal area. And we can do this with hexagon, which we certainly prefer, or we can do this with, uh, with standard squares. Now, the problem with these different representations is, of course, that it can be a bit difficult for new viewers to kind of situate themselves in this kind of representation. So sometimes it's actually beneficial to have a smooth animation from the standard map view that they, they're used to looking at and into the new representation that we want them to, to continue working with because it's less biased in, in terms of visualization. So we can do this by just simply taking all this data that we have generated, stack it with R bind, and then, then just plot it with, uh, with ggAnimate. Now there's, there's some complications here because the, um, the squares comprise of four points, the hexagons comprise of six points, and the, and the, the real areas comprise of both separate uh, islands and, and so on, and a huge number of points. So how do we, how do we actually interpolate between these two? Um, and thankfully, that just kind of happens automatically, um, because uh, there's this package I've made that calls Transformer that, that takes care of everything for you. So you really don't have to think a lot about it. It, it, just, it just happens that it figures out how many points should be inserted, how should we rotate each other so we have uh, the smoothest animation between them and so on. So a lot of things uh, are gained for free, and I hope you can begin to accept that there's not a lot of different operations going on, but it's possible to, to create a huge amount of different types of visualization with this type of tool. Wrapping up, uh, I'm going to talk just slightly about what I plan to do, if I get the time. Um, performance I is a huge thing. Um, I think, personally, my goal is that we have should have real-time animations in R. I mean, with this 2018, I think that's not too much to ask. But we're not there yet. Um, and, and to get there, there will be need for, for a lot of stuff to happen in, in the whole re rendering stack. So ggplot2 should probably see some, uh, some performance improvement. Grid should probably see some performance improvement. Uh, and the graphic devices itself could also be more performant. Now, this is uh, not uh, high-profile work. Uh, I think it's, it's actually something that, that would take a lot of time with very little uh, fun uh, to it. But this is something I'm, I'm personally going to, to look into, at least. Uh, I hope others will, too, because I think it would benefit the whole, the whole uh, R ecosystem in general. Now, there's this whole idea about segways that I, that I have kindly moved to the, to the bottom of the list. But, but I do think that, that it's uh, important to, to have them. 
at least in order to kind of orchestrate separate animations together. Like you, you have one animation that is a scene and you want to transition over to a new one to show some new data maybe or show it in a new way and then animate that. So I think there's, there's definitely a need for it and it's something I'm going to look into, but there's technical things that, that means that it might be uh, a lot of, of trouble, but I'm definitely going to look into it. And then at least I, I do hope at some point that either me or someone else would be inclined to, to take this idea that I talked about uh, earlier, that we have this, this fantastic uh, combination of the different grammars, that, that they all have their different parts in the system and they all work together perfectly. Um, this is something that would require, at least if it has should happen in the, in the R world, require that, uh, that interactivity be better supported in R. Um, this is something that would be really, really difficult to do by just throwing things at, uh, at JavaScript and getting things to back together because both the current uh, implementation of GG Animate and the current uh, implementation of, of GGplot2 is based in, in, uh, in R and if the interactivity comes from JavaScript it's going to be a mess. So, so I do hope that this is something we can strive for. I think it would be a, a really, really powerful tool to have and it would be be meaning that that interactive and animated uh, graphics would be something that would be just as natural to make for us um, aesthetic graphics. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Wow, I feel so static now, Thomas. <laughs> um, we. Uh, a few minutes for questions. There's some roving mics around. If you put up your hand, someone with the mic will come. Hi. Um, my question is about the gap minder animation, mm -hmm. um, specifically the one where you delete a decade worth of data and then you interpolate um, like the animation between 1970 and 1980, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I am interested in that same animation, but actually comparing the interpolated points with the actual data. Like, how much harder would it be to make this animation? Uh, you would just add an additional layer with the full data set, and then that would happen. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this is a great talk. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to could you say a word on how the animations could be exported or you know, transported somewhere else. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, as I started by saying, the renderer is, is kind of agnostic. So, by default, it uses magic, and uh, and you can use magic to export GIFs. Um, but there is no reason why you shouldn't make it into a movie. I think GIFs are having a, a second coming uh, with with the social media, um, and and in general, I think it's it's actually a fantastic format because most. Most web pages uh, support this as a, as a general uh, picture format, and you just have support for animations. Um, but there is like there's no shortcoming. If if you are the thing that, that the renderer takes is, is just a vector of of, uh, of image files, and they can be combined however you want it. So the animation package can can export uh, MPEG files if you want it as a video or whatever. Over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, are those uh, animations? Pausable at all, like the the gap minder one that you showed us. Mm -hmm. uh, could you pause it at a particular year and then say hover the mouse over a country to work out which country it was to get a tooltip, something like that? Um, well, that that goes into the the idea of, of having interactivity in some way. So so interactivity is, is not supported in any way. So you wouldn't be able to get the, the hovering right now. Um, but it is possible to. Um, it, it, it's, it's a bit of some of the underlying tools allows you to, to take the, the exported animation and split it up based on some of the parameters that you have in your data. So, so you, can, you can get the full animation, you can split it up into two and, and, and put it on two different slides. So if you want to, you have an animation and want to like gradually progress it during a slideshow, you can do that with no, with no problem. A lot of the different websites where you have uh, GIF supports allow you to just click on the GIF and it will it will pause. It's 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 more uh, a matter of how it's um, of the viewer than than of the the one making the the animation. If that makes sense. Yeah. Hi Thomas, nice Hi. talk. Um, couple of things, actually two questions. Mm -hmm. One is sometimes there are legitimate intermediate stages. How difficult is it to put your own transform function? And um, I think that's good enough. 
So I'm not sure if I, I follow. So, so there's uh, legitimate intermediate states in in your during your animation. Yeah. So quite often it's just a linear interpolation or some mm -hmm. sort of um, way to go from one state to another. Yeah. And those <coughs> intermediate stages don't mean anything. Um, and that's been one of the reasons that some of my collaborators have been unhappy with doing animations. But sometimes you actually have a legitimate, or something that means something, it, the intermediate stages actually have a, uh, a meaning if you do the interpolation mm -hmm. in a specific way. So you want to prolong it to, to like insert a static stage or whatever. I want to be able to put my own transform function in. Okay, yes. So, so like it's extensible by nature. So. Uh, so you can write your own transition function, uh, and and you could probably subclass the transition states to do that, and just insert whatever you want. But that's of course not something that you would you would do if you're just a uh, normal user. But if it's a legitimate use case, then then it should be easy to implement. It's just something that I've not done. Okay. Hey Thomas, amazing talk. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Um, hey, up there. Um, <laughs> a question about the yellow bubble. So. Um, once we have like this native R utopia, um, how do we distribute these things? Yeah, so that's in, interactively <laughs> native in R, have you thought about a pathway for distributing these? Mm, I haven't because, well, it's, it's so far off right now that I, I haven't. So the, the thing that is fantastic with JavaScript is that it's easily embeddable in, in, in Markdown documents, easily embeddable in, in a lot of different things. Um, I'm think, I think that we're also kind of fooling ourselves uh, about the utility of JavaScript in, in terms of embeddability, because if we want to have truly like um, uh, very very deep interactive and uh, and, and uh, animated visualization, we often need an R backend to, to kind of drive the computation and so on. And then it's not a single uh, web page anymore. Then you will need a shiny application to do a lot of these uh, sort of things. Or we would need to re-implement all the things that we really want to do in JavaScript, and then we're kind of back at square zero. So there is like simple uh, interactive graphics with hover information and so on. Is I, mean, I think JavaScript is, is fantastic for that. Um, I don't think there is any good way to embed uh, like really really complicated uh, statistical interactive uh, animated um, visualization yet in any format actually. And I don't know how that should be solved. I mean that's that's a huge order, <laughs> and it's a bigger problem. I, I agree. Yes. Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> if not, in the movies, all the books, posters, newspapers, all have animations mm -hmm. in them. Um, so I wonder, for us to accommodate, um, to make that reality in our world, what kind of transformation or reinvention or reform we should do, for instance, how our applications can all accommodate animations inside or the PDF or whatever, if you still publish paper in Well, I think we should stop printing out stuff. <laughs> that's, that, that's kind of the first step. I mean, I've, probably at some point we'll have paper with, which supports like moving imagery. But, but for now, we should, we should embrace the screen at least. And, and GIFs is, as I said before, like it's a fantastic format because most, most places have support for GIFs and, and they just animate it by themselves. It doesn't need any additional work for us. What you lose is, of course, interactivity because it's just, just kind of a movie that, that, that rolls her over, but, but it, I think it, it will support most of our ideas about wanting to, to sh give a story in, in, in a time, uh, time frame. So I don't think there's that much to be done. Yep. I have no idea. Oh, sorry, wait. Yeah, we're ah, good. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was really great. Um, just wondering about the blue bubble, or the, um, or the green bubble, maybe. Um, that. Is that, um, so, <laughs> What order of operations do you think, like is it first ggplot needs to be improved and then grid and then graphics and like how far away are we from um, getting the real time? Um, I think in terms of just ggAnimate, like if, if that was the only thing I was worried about, I think grid would be the first step because 
almost all of the ggplot2 parts is, is happening up front. So there's a, there's a computation up front and then it begins to render. And, and, and the rendering step is, is, is really just taking uh, grid objects and, and rendering them. Um, and like grid is fantastic. It has never been intended for, for real-time uh, real imagery. So, so there's a, there are some things that could be improved there. Um, it's also, I think it's a, it's a huge job to, to look into. Um, but it's certainly something I, I want to do. And I think there are some low-hanging fruits that we could, we could easily take. So uh, the rendering speed on my very old computer right now is, is for, for, most plot, uh, for most animations, it's around four frames per second. And, and for very simplistic ones without text, it's around 10 frames per second. And 10 frames per second might sound not a lot, but this is actually the, the frame rate of the, of the GIFs I showed you. So 10 frames per second is, is usually enough to, to get the sensation of, uh, of, of uh, fluid movement. The eye is, is like hyper-performant in interpolating themselves. Um, so if we could just like reach 10 frames per second for, for like most plots, that would be amazing. Um, but then there's these other special cases like with maps, it falls below one frame per second. So that's like, that's not good. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, but, but I think that we can, we can put in incremental improvement if, uh, if that is something that, that is going to be accepted, of course. Graphic devices, I'm, I'm, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to understand how, how much, how huge a part the graphic devices is compared to grid. Like it's, it, it feels all tangled together, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that like I'm, I've been looking into GPU uh, powered graphic devices and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it would at least give some sort of benefit and if this benefit would be translated to like everywhere that you, uh, you, you're plotting stuff. Um, but again, that's, that's kind of low level stuff that I'll need to teach myself, so. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thanks for the great talk. So my question is about a follow up to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, Within the current uh, restraints of non-real time rendering, I assume GG Animate will play well with um, Shiny. So if if it does, then we will have an ugly hack into like animated and interactive, right? Um, so so GG Animate would uh, I, I guess work fine with with uh, <laughs> with Shiny. Like it it could render and export a GIF that could be put in or a movie that could be could put in. Um, the the problem is again that like translating interaction in a GIF into something that you, you would um, you respond to with code is, is it's not the best way. Like, like you're, you're deliberately uh, putting yourself in a, in a difficult position with that. So I think that to have interactivity, we would need, like, we would need streaming interactions or streaming animations. So, so it would just happen as, as, it, as it would render. And we would need a, a device driver that allowed for, for like very powerful interactions and being able to intercept the current animation and doing new computations on the fly. Uh, and that is something that is simply not built into anything right now. Um, but, but there's no problem in, in, in using GG Animate to, to create like uh, a movie to show based on parameters in the shiny, shiny app. Our time's up, so uh, let's leave the questions there. And thank you, Thomas, for a very animated and interesting talk. <laughs>